Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the spring lecture series for 2021. My name is Carrie Soden. I'm the archaeological and research director here at the National Museum of the Great Lakes. With me also tonight, curating the Q&A is Ellen Kennedy, our education and visitor experience director. Thank you all for signing up. This is really a great outpouring of support with over 180 people signed up to view our webinar tonight and over $350 in donations. Please don't forget, you can always support us and continue to donate at nmgl.org backslash donate. Now you've joined us all tonight for our capstone event of our Port of Toledo then and now experience. This was something that we um, worked with and, and worked on um, during uh, the late 2019 as an idea for our very first online exhibit. And unbeknownst to us, in the middle of March, just as we're about to post the very first beginning of the Tol Port of Toledo then and now, the pandemic hits and shutdowns start. And we're actually in great position to immediately have content to share with all of our members as well as our stakeholders. Throughout the year, we have posted 60 then photos and now 60 now photos with the last update being published just this past Monday. You can always check out the, uh, the exhibit at nmgl.org backslash Port of Toledo. We've also used this content, not just for the online exhibit and now this round table that we're gonna have tonight, but we've also put together a physical exhibit at the ProMedica headquarters, which Yes, with everything going on is not open to the public, but we did record some tours of the exhibit, which you can find on our YouTube page. And for those of you that are Inland Seas subscribers, you should have received your 2021 Port of Toledo calendar. If you would like one of these and are not an Inland Seas subscriber, please consider joining or upping your membership to that level. Tonight, we're gonna to tackle three of the overarching themes throughout the exhibit, recreation and fishing, shipbuilding and cargo, and navigation and safety. We will have two speakers on each topic, a then and a now, and there will be a short Q&A between each topic, so after the then and the now speakers. Please use the Q&A button to submit your questions, and those will be curated by Ellen um, at the appropriate time. So let's get this started. We're going to start with um, recreation and, fish and fishing. Representing the then is Ted Ligabel. Uh, Ted is descended from a Great Lakes captain and lighthouse keeper and began his career in historic preservation in 1974 as historic survey manager for the Landmarks Committee of the Maumee Valley Historical Society. He retired in 2019 as the director of graduate historic preservation program at Eastern Michigan University. He's been involved with many preservation and conservation projects, including the Wildwood Preserve, Fallen Timbers Battlefield, and the Vistula Historic Dif District, and the River Raisin National Battlefield, has published works on the architecture of the Maumee River Valley, the Toledo Zoo, Clark Lake, Michigan, and recently co-authored the nation's best-selling textbook on historic preservation. Ted is uh, also works directly with the um, parks, uh, Metro Parks, and uh, so to offset him or to be on his other side with the now, to find out what's going on with Maumee River recreation and fishing, we have Shannon Hughes. Dr. Shannon Hughes has worked with the Metro Parks for 15 years and is currently serves as the director of programming. We think the, the work the Metro Parks is doing along the Maumee is completely indicative of how recreation on the Maumee is shaping up in the 21st century. And with that, we'll get going and I will ask Ted to get us started. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, Thank you very much, Carrie. It should be fun. I'm always a little nervous about being the one to kick it off, but I think I think we should be good. I can handle a lot of the the then. Um, and and I wanted to just suggest that even probably through most of these presentations, we're sort of looking at this as a as a continuum, uh, something that is, that has happened over time, and that that generations and generations of uh, humans have been involved in uh, from earliest period of human occupation, which as, as many know, goes back many thousands of years, uh, right on up to the present. And we'll, we'll end with Shannon talking about one of the most exciting uh, and uh, current projects that Metro Parks is working on. 
So with that, let, let's move to the next slide. And I wanted to uh, uh, introduce it by way of the Native Americans because we, uh, we pay homage to them in the sense that they really were the first uh, occupants of the valley, uh, even here as the valley was forming um, from its glacial period uh, 10, 12,000 years ago. One of the things I find really interesting about uh, their period of occupation was the fact that we know, for example, that during the summers, they migrated to the river and to the lake and to the bay from the interior uh, where, where they would often uh, retreat in the winter, um, uh, places like oak, oak openings, for example, um, which uh, where you could seek shelter and also be able to hunt. But of course, in the summer, um, they're out uh, on the river fishing and recreating, of course. Uh, we don't have any pictures from that period. Um, but the next image that the Metro Parks let me use uh, is kind of indicative of, of what we might have seen, particularly at that point where the cultures are all meeting. Um, and you can see uh, Indians in canoes and actually what looked more like pirogues. This is uh, Fort Miamis, uh, a, a sketch that Metro Parks had done. Um, we really need to think of, of the river and, and consequently the bay and the lake as, as highways, right? That's what everybody was uh, using in order to get around. The really cool thing about the Maumee is that it is like an interior uh, I-75 or, or turnpike because it connected the Great Lakes watershed with the Mississippi water, watershed um, by running uh, where the Maumee starts up at Fort Wayne. Just on the other side of Fort Wayne is the Wabash River watershed, which flows into the Mississippi watershed. So uh, Native Americans were very, <laughs> very uh, smart about that. They knew where the best travel routes were. And one of those was the Maumee Valley, which consequently was one of the reasons so many cultures were fighting over it because it was very strategic uh, and, and very economic, even, even from the very uh, earliest of days. So uh, let's fast forward. Um, I, I could spend the whole evening talking about how we got from the 1790s through the 1800s and uh, up up to the period we're going to I'm going to sort of jump to in the late 1800s and, and early 1900s uh, but I think that that the draw of being on the water has always been something that has been a major uh, influence on, on most everybody that has lived here some more so than others um, and it seems like you go back in your history, if your families go back far enough, there's always somebody that is in some way connected, whether it was merely, you know, a, a being fisher, fisherman or fisherwoman, or, you know, being on a boat on the lakes or a lighthouse keeper as one of my ancestors was. But this draw to be on the water um, when you live in a place like ours that is so heavily influenced and defined by water uh, is very, very powerful. And we see it even in, like I said, Native Americans coming to the, the shorelines and the riverbanks in the summertime. And that certainly carries through uh, after the area is, is settled by um, Americans and Europeans. And so we, we see a couple of images here uh, and these were both in the uh, Port of Toledo exhibit but they're particularly telling. Um, and partially because neither one of them exists, it's important that we remember them because they were a big deal. Uh, the Presque Isle one was on the east side, actually out Bayshore Road. Um, and Larry Michaels will maybe know a little bit more about if there's anything left. I don't think there's anything left of it uh, now, but it was extremely popular. Uh, there was a, a you know, a point of land that stuck out into the water and so was readily accessible. And you can see every version of a uh, vessel in the water there. What I really love is the, the perspective on this drawing. Notice the size of the uh, steamship uh, passenger ship on the left compared to the little teeny one on the right. Um, that may not be an exaggeration. I have a couple other examples. 
obviously this draw continues to the present day. Um, and, and we see it manifested in many, many forms of recreation. Um, some of them like fishing, which, which I suppose cross the line of being economic based and um, recreational based. Um, if we look at the next image, you can see um, it, this is amazing to me. And those of you that, that um, know old pictures and, and enjoy looking at them, um, uh, the, the uh, National Museum of the Great Lakes has a wonderful collection of photographs that are curated by the, uh, it's a Center for Archival Collections out of BG and the uh, Great Lakes collection, but also the Images in Time collection of the Toledo-Lucas County Public Library Local History Division is remarkable. And, and many of these images, even the one that uh, the museum used came from that collection. But to, to say that passenger ships excursion boating was a big deal uh, back in the day is sort of an understatement. Uh, but it continues even today. There's a vintage picture of the arrow, as you can see, with people just jam packed to get onto it. Um, and notice in the background of the right is the Edison steam plant, which of course is uh, still there today as the uh, Prometica headquarters. Um, these boats called at the foot of Madison Avenue primarily um, daily, multiple times during the day, out to Sugar Island, out to Putin Bay, out to Middle Bass, Kelly's Island, Pelee, Point Pelee, I mean, all over the place. And it was one of the most popular things to do. It has maintained somewhat popularity. You'll see, anybody remember the Arowana, the <laughs> Arowana and the Arowana Princess? Um, that's the boat you see on the right there, uh, the colored uh, image. Uh, from the 1970s, that's a picture I took back in the day. Uh, but the Sandpiper, right, lives on today, um, still doing uh, the same function as these earlier boats. So um, another of the really important uh, places for recreation was this, uh, the, what they call the Toledo Casino. And I have a picture of that I wanted you to see. Probably many of you have seen this picture it's a postcard and there are multiple postcards of this. Um, but it's a lot of fun because it really is a step back in time and gives you a sense of what a big deal this was. And actually there were two of these, they both burned down over time, but um, and, and it's a little misleading because the, the casino, what we think of as a casino today is not really uh, what it was then, although some gambling may have occurred. But it's mostly a big dance hall, place you could get something to eat. You were on the water. Notice this one is actually built out into the water. Those rushes that you see just to the right of the railing um, actually were probably water lilies. Toledo was very, very well known for its um, estuaries that were just clogged full of, of uh, lilies of varying types. And, and so that was one of the things people came to see. I think if you look at the arcs over the, the boardwalk here to get to the casino, all brand new with light bulbs, one of the new things of the day must have been very magical. Um, you know, around the Bayview Park, Cullen Park area. Um, and again, I, I don't know if anybody's dove or, uh, and looked for any of the foundations, but they may well be there. But this was a really important piece of the recreational heritage of, um, of Toledo. And, and winter was no obstacle. And you'll see in the next image that, you know, people, <laughs> the image that I love by Charles Mensing, an early Toledo photographer on the left about 1910. Um, look at that river, just, fit. this is uh, Summit Street, just north of Cherry. And it is just packed with skaters, as you, you can see. Um, and then of course, ice boating on the right, which is something that uh, has been with us and, and continues to be. Uh, maybe we'll see some of it this coming week once we get a little more solid ice on, on some of the river and, and the bay. I'm not sure about the bay. Um, so, you know, winter was never an obstacle and people knew, figured out how to recreate. Sledding, of course, um, is still very popular and the Metro Parks has several sledding hills uh, that we can use. Another very popular pastime was this. 
flooding. How many of you can say that you have never gone out to look at the remains of the flood, particularly recently at Side Cut Metro Park, where it seems like almost every year they've had to close the road? Um, that is a perennially popular uh, pastime in, in this area, particularly in, in the spring, uh, March, when you get the, the uh, river melting and the ice flows. The, the picture on the upper left is uh, Waterville, believe it or not. And the, the right below it is Grand Rapids. And we, you know, we know that, that uh, those towns that sit low on the, uh, in the floodplain um, are often ravaged by flooding, even, even up to into our lifetimes. But you can also see uh, the middle picture and then the one on the right, which are taken downtown along the waterfront. Uh, a, a somewhat dangerous pastime, but seems like people want to get out on that ice. And so there they are standing on those big ice flows. Um, hopefully they, they didn't let loose at any time soon. The next picture will show you even um, a little bit closer, some of the images of, of right downtown. Water Street flood was a big flood in 1918, of course, the big, big one in 1913. There was one in 1888, um, some in the 80, 1980s uh, that some of you may remember. Um, you can see uh, in the, the larger picture the people putting in a boardwalk so people could get across Water Street, which was now completely uh, submerged. And, and then the one on the right, the old island house, which is down on the middle grounds. Uh, it's hard to imagine when you're there today looking at, at the middle grounds park that this indeed was, was once one of the busiest industrial uh, sites in the city. But there you can see the water actually invaded the lobby of the Island House in the 1880s. Okay, um, let's move along and just a quickie to show you the steam plant for perspective. I love the one on the right. February 16, 1918, where they had to actually put a, a upper level boardwalk into the second story into the window to get it, people get people to get to work at the, the steam plant. Kind of funny. Okay, and the last one on flooding, uh, the 1885 flood, the ice jam at the Cherry Street Bridge. And then the one on the upper right, I think is a lot of fun because the advent of the automobile opened up uh, these excursions in the spring to many people. I don't know whether that's River Road. I suspect it is where that little Model T uh, is going through. And just look at the ice on either side that they had to plow out in order to get the cars through. But they are getting the cars through because people wanted to come out and see it. We celebrate ice too, which I think is kind of interesting. There's a, This is a festival that was down at Promenade Park back in the 80s when they did some uh, ice carving. Another image will show you, some, it, sometimes it's just beautiful to get out. Today we went for a walk in Oak Openings and it was magical. And, and you just sometimes have to just get out um, and look around. A lot of people are, are nature lovers, hikers, cross country skiers, uh, snowboarders, uh, jet skiers. And part of that is just getting out in, on the water uh, in, in viewing it um, as, as it has come to us uh, through the generations. And then the last slide is one that we sort of segues into what um, uh, Shannon is going to talk about, the incredible work that the Metro Parks is doing uh, in terms of reclaiming and celebrating our, our riverfront heritage and wanting everybody to be just within a few minutes of a Metro Park. Um, I, I'm so, I cut off that guy's face on the left. Sorry, wherever you are, but I didn't have his permission to use his picture, so I figured I better. But but there you go. This is the kind of thing that we see happening, particularly in the spring. Um, you know, when we had the walleye run, which traditionally could bring ten thousand people to the area, meaning they spent six to to seven, even up to nine million dollars in that period in March. So. Um, Again, it, it, the recreational aspects of this river and this lake and this bay are really one of the distinctive threads that holds us together and defines who we are. So with that, uh, I can turn it over to Shannon, unless um, 
Carrie, did you want to say anything in between? Nope, Shannon, it's all you. Thanks, Ted. We'll have questions again when once Shannon is done. Feel free sure. to do the Q&A um, and to type your questions in. Uh, thanks. I'm Shannon with Metro Parks. Thanks, Ted, for um, the beautiful setup with Sidecut Metro Park. Um, we do have uh, multiple parks that are located along the river that do offer recreation. Uh, we have Sidecut, we have Farnsworth, we have the little known uh, secret gem Benview. Um, we also have um, Providence and so Middle Ground. So we do have lots of uh, parks that are located on the Mighty Mommy is what we call it. Um, but the one that I wanted to focus on uh, today is actually actually Glass City Metro Park. Um, and that is going to be our newest park. Um, and what we are really most excited about is the ability to have two riverfront parks located in downtown Toledo. So you have middle grounds, but now you're also going to have Glass City. And Glass City is going to be a really cool um, new opportunity for programming, for recreation, and to really um, make sure that all of the citizens in Toledo are able to have a park within five miles of, uh, or to live within five miles of a park. So we're very excited to be coming downtown on the east side at Glass City. Um, so the next slide I wanna show is kind of our rendering of phase one and phase two of Glass City. Um, so right now, if you are familiar with uh, the east side on downtown, uh, you will have um, seen that we did actually open phase one of Glass City. And when we talk about phase one, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about about how we actually built the park and the infrastructure that's there. And then phase two is gonna be the infrastructure that we are actually going to start constructing, um, hopefully as early as June. Um, but again, with weather and, and those kinds of things, it is subject to change. Um, but the way that we built Glass City Metro Park is we observed an 80-20 rule, which means 80% of the park will actually remain natural or be naturalized. And so one of the things that we at Metro Parks are really working hard to um, make sure we do is bring back the natural habitats and the natural landscape that would have been there um, before um, industrialization took place. And this site was definitely, as Ted mentioned, for middle grounds. Um, um, this site was actually very heavily industrialized as well. And so we're going to be bringing it back more towards those natural scapes. Um, when we talk about 80-20, 20% of it is that built infrastructure um, that you're used to. So that's gonna be your trails, your restroom, um, some of your picnic shelters, the facilities. And so we like to maintain that 80-20 rule. Um, as I mentioned, there are two actual phases. The first phase is complete at this point in time. So um, I do want to throw in a pitch that if you haven't been to Glass City yet, we are having an open house this weekend. Um, so on the, the uh, Saturday and Sunday, um, there will be programmers there who will be able to answer questions. We're hoping that there will be sledding, still some snow on, on the ground there to use that. Uh, sledding hill and that's what I'm going to talk about now is some of the recreation opportunities that you can find in phase one. Um, so we already have the Glass City Pavilion, we have a sledding hill, we have an event lawn, and a kayak cove. Um, so far with Glass City we've had over 12 acres of native prairie which has been planted um, by a custom blend that is grown at Metro Parks, Harvard harvested and then processed at our Blue Creek Seed Nursery. So um, we are bringing back our native species um, and our plant species at Blue Creek and then replanting them into the parks that we are uh, currently working on. Um, we've had over five acres of woodland restoration already take place on the site and over 1,500 linear feet of shoreline restoration. Um, and so it's it's a little hard because I can't really point at this point in time to what I'm going, what, what I'm talking about for phase one. Um, but if you do look over um, and you look at your screen, phase one is actually to the left. Um, so phase one, in, yes, thank you, Carrie. So you see the pavilion, you see the event lawn, the sledding hill over here. Um, and those are all the areas that we consider phase one that are now open. Um, what we're really excited about is going to be phase two. And so phase two is going to be everything um, that is actually more towards your right hand side. 
Um, and that, like I said, we're, we're looking at construction to begin spring or summer. Um, and this is going to include an ice ribbon, adventure play nodes, water play nodes, and a hammocking hill. Uh, this will also have over 15 acres of native prairie restoration taking place, 12 acres, of, 12 plus acres of woodland restoration, and over 1,700 linear feet of shoreline restoration. So what are you gonna be able to do at the park? Well, let's talk a little bit about phase two because that's what most folks are really curious about at this point in time. Like I said, right now, if you join us this weekend, you can definitely take a look at the Glass City Pavilion we have um, and the sledding hill and the other amenities that are already there. I don't think you wanna check out the Kayak Cove right now. Um, it'll be, it'd be a little bit of a, a chilly, chilly uh, recreation there for you. Um, but if we go to slide three, we can go ahead and talk about the ice ribbon um, and some of the amenities that you're going to see coming down there. Um, so, as, so for the ice ribbon, we're looking at over 1,800 square feet of a skating surface. Um, the ice ribbon um, is outlined here. You can see actually in the ribbon shape, but we're also looking at a skating pond as well. Mm -hmm. Um, what's really interesting about that is you don't have to bring your own skates. Um, if you do, my daughter, she is a hockey player and I know she is super excited to, to get on the ice here, but don't worry if you are not a skater and you just want to go and give this a try. Uh, we will have skate rentals. Um, there will be a warming room inside of an adjacent market hall type area um, that we will be building. And again, you can see it actually, it's going to be at the lower um, right hand of the drawing. Um, is kind of where the, the Zamboni will be, the ice market will be, um, and so that's kind of the area that will be built infrastructure around this ice ribbon. Um, we will also have, to keep you warm, we'll have fire pits and warming stations. Um, and then we're also going to look at how we can recreate safely at night. And so most folks know um, that Metro parks tend to close at dark in the winter. Well, this park, obviously we want folks to be able to enjoy different kinds of recreation on the river. Um, and so we'll be keeping this one potentially open later um, with light, lights and music for nighttime enjoyment. Um, I do also wanna point out since we're talking about nighttime, there are some opportunities at some of our river parks to actually go out um, and enjoy the river after dark. So we do have parks open after dark now um, for folks to enjoy if, if um, that's something you're interested in. Um, take a look at our website for that. Um, we can go on to the next slide. All right, so I talked about water play areas and I talked about adventure nodes. And so this is something really exciting for us as well is because normally when you go to a Metro Park, uh, say Wildwood, you will see a, an infrastructure built like a normal playground. Well, like Ted was talking about, we wanna harken back more towards some of the historic uh, recreation opportunities. And so we're looking at these water journey opportunities, these water play nodes as opportunities to reconnect folks and kiddos, um, because these are for everybody. We're not just talking kiddos for the, the water journey. Um, we're encouraging adults, teenagers, everybody to really enjoy um, these features. And so, so there are going to be different elements that really pull in the Maumee River and the special amenities and, and features that are the Maumee River. So we're looking at having a frog pond, a mini Maumee, a waterfall, potentially misting boulders, headwaters, um, and, and rain towers. And basically what this is going to do is it's going to take you on a journey um, of the Maumee River into Lake Erie, because as we know, our water quality is so important to how we how we recreate as well. So you've got kayaking that you can do, um, you've got fishing, you've got boating, um, you've got stand-up paddle boarding, you've got all of these wonderful activities you can do, but you can't do them unless you take care of our natural resources. And so some of the things that we'll be interpreting in these, these areas is how to to not only recreate safely, but also the importance of conserving our natural resources so we continue to have them. Um, and so we've just gone ahead 
and pulled out some of the amenities that will be in this water journey. So there's going to be those rain towers um, that are going to capture light and water elements that actually begin our rain journey, um, our water journey. Then we've got artistic elements. Um, we've got some misting boulders for low key water play if we don't want to get uh, drenched there. Um, we've got flea a little bit more free flowing water um, and then a scaled map of the Maumee River and its tributaries that are going to be interactive water play. So again, um, while you're playing, you're actually going to be learning about the importance of the Maumee um, to not only our watershed, but the overall health and ecosystem of Lake Erie. Um, we also have frog ponds because we are frog city. Um, and so we do want to make sure that we throw, throw a little hands up to our history of being frog town um, and really bring back the habitats that are going to welcome back those amphibians, um, our reptile friends, and definitely concentrate on migratory birds um, because as Ted was mentioning fishing, um, birding is also a wonderful activity that you can do on the river. So we have our shorebirds, um, we have some, uh, we have everybody knows bald eagles, um, so we definitely want to make sure that we are bringing the habitat back so that that people can also enjoy our, our migratory friends and our, our um, year-round natives as well. Next, please. Um, so this is where we also look at discovery play is going to be a little bit different than our water play areas. So we are actually looking at a prairie and a pollinator um, play nodes. And so again, um, really making sure that we're immersive into our natural habitats as we're teaching our kiddos and our teens and our, our adults how to enjoy our natural scape um, through these discovery play nodes. And so this is much more natural play um, and it's integrated with true play experiences that people can enjoy they can they can really discover um, how to how to enjoy this park so we're going to have tunnels discovery elements ad adventure rope obstacle courses there is all kinds of um, ideas right now that we're really trying to flesh out um, to make sure that we take into consideration um, what folks really want to see happen at this park um, the, the main theme, though, is bringing back our prairies and our pollinator species, because as we know, they're so important to a healthy ecosystem of the of the river and in general for for food and for other things. Next one. And then this is just a little bit more about um, some of the, the features that potentially we're looking into. So you have a prairie maze experience, you have natural adventure play elements and interpretive planting garden areas for educational engagement. Next. Um, so this is just the overall, the woodland play node that we're looking at. So again, we have our prairie, our pollinator, and then we have our woodland play node. Um, and so these are all habitats that you would see along the Maumee River. Um, and so we want to make sure that as we move forward, forward, we're connecting our park system together and our, our habitats that you can find throughout Lucas County as well. Um, so again, we are looking at embankment slides, a zip line, earthscape swings, um, and this area is going to be adjacent to the sledding hill, the picnic shelter, the restrooms, and the, the parking area. So um, next, I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. <laughs> Again, these are just potential conceptual um, images of what we are looking at doing for those play nodes. Um, and then the, the newest part um, that we want to make sure that we call out when we talk about then and now recreation and what you can do at the Maumee is we want to provide that connectivity um, for those who are cyclists. And so one of the things that we are doing is we are trying to connect our parks um, along the Maumee River and connect parks to parks. Um, and so we are building a bridge, um, a bicycle and pedestrian bridge over Main Street that's going to connect existing trails at Glass City um, and International Park. And we're really excited about this because the construction is going to start um, 
hopefully relatively soon when the weather allows it to, but more than half of the cost is actually being paid by federal grants obtained through TEMACOG. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to not only offer um, kayaking, um, hiking, walking, um, bird watching, sledding, um, hammocking, all of those activities along the river, but we're also making sure that we're connecting safely the ability for folks to walk, hike, or bike um, to throughout this area. Um, I did get a question. Is it okay if I answer the question? Um, I was asked if the best place to ski and paddleboard. Um, so that depends on your location. We have multiple parks, I think, that would um, probably suit, but paddleboarding, we do um, do. Um, do have at our Oak Openings Park. So we do at Wiregrass, um, which is a is an inland pond. We also have had it at um, Side Cut as well. But Blue Creek um, is also a favorite spot for paddle boarding. Again, it depends on the temperature and uh, of the water and the depth of the pond that you're going to be in. Um, and ski is that ice skiing or um, I think uh, it's cross country, country? skiing. Cross country skiing. Okay, so we do groom trails at Oak Openings and Secor Metro Park for cross country skiing. Uh, we oh, did so have there's a. The, there's um, the question came underneath as well. So I'm yeah, not sure there I'm was a related to... question about whether they th you thought you were going to include that at the new park as well. Um, I have not heard that that is um, that I have not heard one way or the other as we are in um, talks about whether there will be a dedicated trail at Glass City. Um, that's an excellent question. If you want to leave your information with one of our hosts, I would be happy to get back to you. Um, with an answer to that. I think we're also excited about the ice ribbon um, that we, we don't necessarily um, have an answer yet for that uh, at Glass City. Um, and I would again have to double check into Wildwood, but I would be happy to get back to you with those answers. All right, thank you. Um, so we had a follow up on that. I think just to repeat, what the two parks were with the groom trails, you said Secor and? Oak Openings. Oak Openings, okay. All right. Um, so we the next question um, we have for Ted, and if you know when the casinos burned down and what caused the fires. I know one of them burned down and was rebuilt a few times. If yeah, I it, it, it's a sad, a sad tale. But the first one um, burned about 1899, and they tried to rebuild it twice. Both of the the rebuilds burned down in 1900 and 1901. Then finally, in 1902, they did rebuild, and it it stood um, till 1910, and it burned too. Uh, there was lots of competition by that point. Um, Toledo Beach up in Monroe County, Bowles Harbor. And so it, it just didn't have the patronage that it did early on. As to how they burned, I, I couldn't really find that. Um, they were all big, huge wooden structures. So, it, you know, a, a multi multitude of things could have happened. But um, needless to say, they, they are all gone now. Thank you. Um, so I know I jumped in and I didn't introduce myself. I'm uh, Ellen Kennedy. I'm the Education Visitor Experience Director for the National Museum of the Great Lakes. And we're going to do, I think, a couple more questions before we move on. Um, it looks like everybody found the Q&A um, section below. Uh, so if you keep putting your questions in, I'm going to try to let you know what we're going to answer live. Um, and then we're also going to have a wrap up Q&A at the very end. Um, just so we can kind of keep moving. Uh, the next question, which I think I know the answer to, but I don't want to, I don't want to presume was, is, was the Maumee River ever clear? And by that, I think they mean not murky or muddy before industrialization, which if either of you have a better answer than I do, which is that it's the muddy mommy for a reason, <laughs> um, I'll let you. Well, I I have read one account that 
was a recollection of someone at the period when the Native Americans and the French first started encountering each other, encountering each other. And it said it was very clear. Um, and you could you could see the sturgeon, you could see the fish. Mm. Uh, how long that lasted, I don't know, because we know also that, say, by the time of the, uh, the period of Battle of Fallen Timbers, the Maumee Valley is extensively farmed by the Native Americans. Um, so we have runoff occurring uh, at that point uh, as well. So I think very early on after the turbidity of its forming as a glacial runoff, it probably did settle down and was clear for, for many, many generations. But as farming began to, to take over, even with the Native Americans, it, it silted up cloudy uh, pretty quickly. Shannon, did you have anything you want to say? No, I was just going to say that um, Judge Potter, if anybody is naturalist um, interested, Judge Potter has some really great accounts of what East Toledo and Toledo downtown looked like um, before heavy industrialization with um, what is one of my favorite uh, is prairie chickens, um, rice patties and prairie chickens. Um, and so there, there are some really great descriptions from Judge Potter in the early 1800s about what uh, downtown would have looked like before heavy industrialization. Great, so I think we're gonna do one question before we move on and I'll remind everybody, we will try to bring some of these back uh, that we weren't able to answer at the end if we have time. Um, and this was just, if you have a um, idea of when the phase two of the Glass City Metro Park is planned to be completed, which I know that's we we Tough don't and actually, <laughs> yeah and actually while we were doing the, while I was um while I was making sure I was actually texting to make sure that my dates were correct um when I was talking about when we were going to begin construction um because it is a moving target as we're all aware um and so it does look like um like I said late late summer now early fall we're we're slated to actually begin the construction um and then uh, we don't, because we're still in the extensive planning phase right now, have a specific end date. Um, but as everybody, I hope, knows, we're super excited about it. And so as soon as we can get it open, we will. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I will turn this back over to Carrie and we'll move on to the next section. And then we will do some more Q&A um, you know, after each section, but we'll do a group Q&A at the end again. Okay, thank you so much, Ted and Shannon. Um, we're gonna move on from recreation to commercial use of the Maumee and the port uh, with highlights, uh, highlighting the shipbuilding uh, and the cargoes. Representing then is Larry Michaels. Larry grew up in East Toledo and um, is tonight representing the East Toledo Historical Society where he's been a member for over 30 years. Uh, he's written several books about the history of Toledo and Northwest Ohio. Uh, the now speaker should be fairly obvious where we're going to source this from. Uh, comes from the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority. We're pleased to have Joe Kappel, the Vice President of Business Development for the Port Authority. Uh, Joe's been with the port since 2004 and is perfect to talk about the commerce happening on the river today. Okay, Oops. Carrie, are we on? Yes. I'm going to have you start your video again, Larry. All right. It's not coming on, Carrie. There we go. Okay. Are we on, Carrie? You are. No. Okay. Well, uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, we're talking about the, the shipping and cargoes and the, the then and a very quick overview of, of the history of that. And if we can go back to the previous slide, um, we're going to leave this slide on while I just do a quick summary. Uh, it's interesting that the Mid-States mid elevator there, 1962 at Facet and, and Miami Street, uh, right there was actually the site of the first, the oldest dateable historic place in Toledo, the Erie uh, Earthen Indian Fort that stood right there along Miami Street. And there's a stone boulder there right by the, the grain elevators today. 
And they were there in the 1650s. And then um, as, the, as we're talking about the, uh, the river is the lifeblood, that's why Toledo's here. And um, the, the commerce, the shipping is really what developed Toledo. And so the Native Americans for it, I guess, was the first thing we can actually date. And then of course the canoes of the Native Americans in the 1700s and the first commerce was really the, the French fur traders coming in, uh, trading with the Native Americans, the late 1700s, first years of the 1800s. Uh, people like the Navars, um, the Navarre brothers who were the first permanent settlers east of the river in 1807. And it really wasn't until after the War of 1812 and the settlers start uh, coming into the area. And it was, it was the waterways that brought them in. Uh, because of the Great Black Swamp, they, they traveled by water. And uh, in 1825, uh, the Erie Canal opened. So that could bring people all the way in from Buffalo, uh, New York, uh, Albany. And then in 1845, we get the opening of the Miami and, and uh, Erie Canal, uh, all the way down to Cincinnati and the Ohio River. And so the, uh, those first settlers were coming in in the early 1800s. And the, the rivers not only brought them in, but they allowed them to transport their goods um, to market. Um, the agrarian uh, products, the natural resources that were shipped, that supported their way of life. And, and from, for example, from 1831 until as late as 1888, wheat was the, uh, wheat was the largest uh, commercial product shipped uh, out of Toledo. And so it was natural in those years, uh, the early 1800s, that the shipbuilding would be started at the head of navigation, the foot of the rapids in uh, Perrysburg and Maumee. And then there were a lot of other little shipbuilding businesses along the river, building the, the two, three mast schooners and the mass, single mass uh, sloops. And, and by 1836, you get um, some building going on in, in Toledo. Um, 1836, the year before Toledo became Toledo, there's a, a, a side wheel, a uh, steam vessel built with wooden propeller uh, called the Don Quixote. And so we get the shipbuilding going on all along the river at this time. But even by the time we get up to the Civil War, there's still not many people uh, here along the river. If we can go now to the, the first actual slide, Harry, this, you see the, the first bridge. Now this would be looking from about Front and Main in East Toledo. At the left, you see a sawmill and uh, Front Street and the little wooden bridge a few feet above the water. And then across uh, in the downtown, you see some warehouses and uh, not much. And this is 1866, the year after that first bridge was built. And at Front and Main, you've just got a hill with some trees on it. And the population of Toledo in 1860 uh, was 13,000. Now things start then to develop pretty quickly. If we go to the next slide, just a few years later, now you see a metal bridge, the second Cherry Street Bridge. You still see the planing mill there, but now the hill's gone and you've got uh, what's called Bridge Street. It was Bridge Street until 1898 when it became Main Street. And the water comes all the way up uh, to Front Street. And there's nothing along Main Street, but you start to see now some houses and some development on the east side. At the lower right is where Wade High School is today. And then downtown now, you get a lot more building uh, just in those few years. And you notice in all these early drawings and lithographs, you see all of the vessels and the river. Um, and then moving ahead just a few more years, the next slide, um, 1876. Now you see the bridge up a little closer. You see all of the commercial uh, buildings downtown along with a few church steeples and, um, and all of the vessels 
up and down the river. And then the, the new thing you see there in the foreground is the railroads and the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania coming across where the viaduct would be later on Main Street and curving out into the river. Um, that the railroads um, coming in at this time was a huge um, boost to Toledo. By uh, 1888, Toledo was second only to Chicago with the number of uh, uh, railroads entering the city. The, um, uh, the other big boost, of course, was immigration. Uh, I said in in 1860, the population of Toledo was uh, 13,000. By 1900, 131,000. Uh, 10, 10 time, tenfold uh, increase. And those people were coming from all over to come into America where there were jobs with a living wage. They could own land, their own properties. Um, and so Toledo was truly the melting pot and, um, and just grew so rapidly during this time. And there again, you see all those vessels on the river and uh, this is 1876. Um, and about 15 years later, um, we have then the, really the commercial shipping start to really develop. Those little shipbuilding operations then became consolidated into the big shipyards along Front Street. Here you see freighters being built in this early 20th century postcard. It uh, started out as Craig shipyards and became the Toledo shipyards. And then uh, in the early 1900s, then America, America shipbuilding, American shipbuilding, uh, the company associated with George Steinbrenner. Uh, I hope there's no Yankee fans uh, here watching tonight. <laughs> and um, and it's, it's still there. Joe can tell us a lot more about the operations going on there now. But, but that was the beginnings now of the iron, the, the metal boats. And that took a, a lot of investment to build these big ships. And that's why it was consolidated. And that's where now the, um, the cargoes are much heavier and, and so much more that we needed the large boats. So it's really in the 1890s where the com commercial shipping really took off. And so um, go to the next slide, we'll look at Front Street. Well, here's the dry docks of the shipyards. We can go to the next slide. Um, all along Front Street, here you see a launching of a, a ship a, car, a freighter in, in 1908. Um, and then the railroad yards coming in along Miami Street. And you see a ship out there and the um, loaders. And then you see grain elevators. And then you see the stone uh, being carried in uh, on the rails. And um, this is in, again, the early 20th century when the, the Shipping is really, really taking off. And then the next slide um, shows the railroad yards. Uh, it was a difficult time to try to get to the docks restaurants <laughs> in International Park. Uh, you look at International Park today, it's hard to imagine all of the shipping that was there. The uh, coal, coal cars. Um, and you see, again, the loader there and a, a a freighter out there in the river. And then uh, moving to the next slide, you look at uh, Front Street looking south, you see the industry developing along Front Street where um, again, the east side along the, the river where the shipyards were and that's where the industries build up where these cargoes were being um, manufactured. Uh, it started with um, the malleable, the next slide. Um, the malleable works was right there on Front Street, about at the end of Consol Street, uh, about, right about across from where Tony Paco's is. And uh, John Manning brought this company to Toledo in 1890. It had about 200 employees. And then with the immigration coming in, and uh, the increase in the commerce, 
By 1915, it had 1,600 employees. Uh, the Hungarian uh, influx coming in built Birmingham in about 15 years from 1890 to early 1900s, uh, pretty much the way it still looks today. And, and then uh, north of the Malleable, uh, in the next slide, you see the, um, the National Milling Company and this, at this period, National Biscuit Company, Nabisco. Um, and this, this aerial view gives you a good idea of the industry. Uh, behind the, the grain elevators is Birmingham area. You see the big Ohio fuel tank there in the middle and then the old Ironville, Ironville community down uh, past that, uh, which started out as iron, um, coke, and in uh, 1860s, as early as that. And then beyond the, the milling company, you've got the, uh, the shipyards. And then north of that, you've got uh, Interlake Iron. Here you see it in its very first years just being built, uh, Interlake Iron there for so many years, a huge operation there along the river. And then north of um, Interlake Iron, you, in the next slide, you had the oil companies, uh, Paragon. There was a Craig Oil, then Paragon. Paragon uh, started in Gibsonburg, where they first discovered oil there in the 1880s, moved to the riverfront in East Toledo. And uh, then in 1930, it was uh, bought out by Gulf Oil. And uh, so the tank farms all along there, um, and all of this is happening very quickly as um, the shipping and, and uh, just increased uh, so much in, uh, around the turn of the 20th century into those first years. Uh, the next slide will um, give us a view. Ted, Ted was talking about Presque Isle. And if you, if you remember that slide of, uh, of the amusement park, it was quite a place. Yeah, uh, mostly you had to go on the pleasure uh, steam boats from the foot of Madison Avenue and go out there on a Saturday and spend the day. It had a midway, it had a Ferris wheel out there. And it's just that little peninsula there in the foreground. But at the same time now, that's long gone by, by this time in the 1930s, you start to see the foundations of the port being built. And then if you look in the distance, you'll see those tank farms and uh, those operations out there um, in North Front Street as, as the, the Port of Toledo is being developed. Uh, the next slide then shows us, uh, if you wanna take a tour of uh, the Schoonmaker, uh, we'll use the Schoonmaker as an example of those freighters, uh, which I loved. And, and you just love to go down to the docks restaurants maybe and, and watch uh, the freighters. And so pretend you're on the deck of the Schoonmaker. Uh, when, when I was on the River East Board, I used to give tours of uh, when it was still uh, called the Boyer down at International Park. And the Schoonmaker, James M. Schoon, Schoonmaker was a colonel in the Civil War. He won uh, the Medal of Honor the Battle of Winchester in 1864. He's only 22 years old, a Civil War hero. After the war, he, um, he was, lived in Pittsburgh and got into heavy manufacturing and a Coke uh, business and was president of several companies and all involved in shipping. So naturally he had a lot of freighters. And so one of them was named after him. And uh, the Schoonmaker was um, uh, launched on July 1st, uh, 1911, uh, out of E-Course. Uh, his daughter christened it. And uh, it was um, 617 feet long, um, 12,650 tons. And it was the Queen of the Lakes when it was first launched. It, if you've toured it, you've seen the beautiful cabins and, uh, and uh, it's, it was just top of the line in every way. It um, then was sold around 1969-70 a couple times. It was connected with um, a Republic Steel. Uh, the president of one of those companies was Willis Boyer and it, it changed that name. 
And, and then um, fortunately, um, it, it was saved. It was bought by Toledo in 1987. It was decommissioned in 1980. And then in 1987, it was put along the riverfront. And then as the museum uh, came into Toledo, uh, uh, 100 years to the minute, on July 1st, uh, 2011, um, it was rechristened uh, the Schoonmaker again and uh, towed down to be right alongside the museum. If you haven't toured it, it's an amazing thing to understand what these ships did. I mean, you look down in the halls, it's like looking down into a gymnasium. They're just huge. The, um, if you stood it up on an end, there's a mark on the deck that uh, it would be the height of the OI building there in the distance. It's again, about a third uh, high above the OI building if you could stand it up on end. And so these freighters are just amazing ships. Um, go to the next slide, we'll um, just, I just mentioned a couple of the thousand footers. Uh, the first one was uh, um, the court, the Stewart court, uh, 1972. Um, first thousand footer, the uh, Indiana Harbor, 1979, had the first uh, satellite navigation on it. The, the longest is the Paul Tregurtha, which is 1,013 and a half feet long, um, and just amazing ships. They, um, they carry one, one cargo load would, would take uh, 30,000 semis to carry. Um, these thousand footers can get 607 miles per gallon of fuel per ton. Uh, just think of that. I mean, that's a lot of tons, so it's a lot of fuel. 607 miles on uh, a gallon of fuel. The, the shipping on the, on the Great Lakes um, saves $3.6 billion a year if we had to rely just on, on uh, trains and trucks. It's a tremendous operation. The next slide right at the end here. Um, uh, some of you may remember uh, Big Lucas. This is the port in, during the 70s, the first huge derrick named for Jerry Lucas, the Ohio State Center for the national championship team in 1960. And so um, the last slide, Joe's gonna be able to pick this up and give you a lot more details about, about the port today. But just to emphasize that it's the shipping, um, it's the river that made Toledo what it is, our location here and our growth. Uh, we have the wonderful museum down there now and I'm so excited to hear what Shannon had to say about, about the, the park being developed. Uh, what a wonderful thing for Toledo to have this happening on the riverfront. So go visit, uh, the uh, museum tour of the Schoonmaker, go on the website. There's a lot of good resources. Uh, shout out quick to, to Ted Long, a lot of his writing, uh, toledoport.org, um, websites like boatnerd.com. Uh, credit to my wife, Susie, who's done online research for this. Uh, and, and go to the websites and learn what you can about the shipping and, and visit, visit the museum. So uh, thank you all for tuning in tonight. Larry, that, that was great. Those pictures were fantastic and certainly gives me a better appreciation for the port and um, the generations of people that, that have worked there and, and how it evolved over the years. Um, my name is Joe Kappel. I'm Vice President of Business Development for the Port Authority. And as you see in this slide, our, our new tagline at the Port Authority is more than a port. And I just wanted to start with a brief overview uh, talking about that and how the Port Authority has evolved uh, over the years. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, we were the first Port Authority established in the state of Ohio around 1955 when construction began on the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, today, there are over 60 Port Authorities in Ohio but most of these port authorities serve as economic development agencies with no real uh, responsibility for transportation assets. 
Uh, port authorities in Ohio have broad based powers, including the ability to construct facilities, issue bonds, make loans and buy and sell properties. Ports can structure, package and coordinate financing transactions with multiple lenders, including commercial banks, state finance authorities and other public sector financing. So economic development is certainly a big part of what we do. The Toledo Port Authority has about 30 employees and we manage a wide array of facilities and programs in support of moving people and goods through the region while stimulating economic development. The Toledo Port Authority operates Toledo Express Airport and Toledo Executive Airport, formerly Metcalf Field for the city of Toledo. And we've done that since 1973. We also own the Martin Luther King Jr. Amtrak station and several Toledo uh, parking garages and office buildings, including one government center, along with hundreds of acres of waterfront, which is leased by private companies that operate Toledo's 17 public and private marine terminals, along with our Toledo shipyard. The Port Authority utilizes financing, energy, foreign trade zone, and brownfield remediation programs to assist and incentivize our partners in the public and private sectors to either come to Toledo or stay in the Toledo region, thus creating jobs and investment for the area. And the mission of the Port Authority is, develop, is to develop expertise and assets that drive and grow the region's transportation and logistics infrastructure and its economic prosperity for all. So next slide, please. You know, I think when most people think of the port, they may think of the grain silos that they see as they're driving over I-75. And that's just the very uh, end of the port. Um, as, as many of you know, the Port Authority is not just in a single location, but it's a network of 16 marine terminals in the shipyard. And that, that, ex that network extends from I-75 all the way uh, along the Maumee, seven nautical miles to the mouth of the river where it meets Maumee Bay. Um, the terminals in Toledo collectively handle between nine and 12 million tons of cargo each year. And that comes and goes on between 400 and 800 vessel calls each year. Now the vessels that call on Toledo's marine terminals include the lake trading vessels and barges along with the ocean going vessels or we call them salties uh, that trade overseas. Most of our trade uh, is with other US ports or Canadian ports. And this map that you're looking at shows the terminals along the Maumee um, mixed in with the marinas and other um, landmarks that you might recognize. So we can go to the next slide. I'll talk a little bit about the Toledo shipyard, uh, which was purchased by the Port Authority in 1988. And it's one of just four major US shipyards uh, on the Great Lakes. And um, as was mentioned, this historic yard has put thousands of people to work in our region, especially during the winter months like now, when the vessels are in dry dock and getting their, their winter uh, maintenance and repair work done. Larry mentioned that uh, George Steinbrenner uh, was once associated with uh, the shipyard here, uh, but today the yard is leased to Ironhead Marine and they've been operating the facility for the Port Authority since 2006. So Ironhead Marine provides dry dock services ranging from survey work and hull repairs to mechanical repairs and rebuilds. Uh, they do blasting and painting projects. Uh, when Iron Hood, uh, Ironhead took over this yard, there were a lot of the older antiquated buildings that you saw in some of the old pictures uh, still scattered about. So one of the first things Ironhead did was work with the Port Authority and demolish some of these older buildings and structures. Um, we demolished the old cranes that are uh, on site and we constructed the new high bay uh, building that you can see um, in, this, in this picture. Um, other more recent investments at the Toledo shipyard have included uh, the reconstruction of the dock wall, a new guard house along Front Street, a new pump house, and the acquisition of a brand new 
Grove off-road crane that has a lift capacity of 165 tons, which is uh, pretty significant. So the shipyard is well equipped and is staffed uh, to handle nearly any project. And this year at the Toledo shipyard, uh, we have three ships booked in for winter work in the dry docks here, uh, the Manitoulin, the Sam Loud, and the American Courage. And the work is all part of their five-year survey uh, um, uh, program. Uh, over the fall, Ironhead performed emergency repairs on the Herbert Jackson and the Tug uh, Prentice Brown. So as you're driving by uh, on Front Street, sometimes you'll look over into the shipyard and you'll see a vessel there in dry dock. Uh, in this picture, we see uh, an Algoma vessel, which is a traditional lake trading vessel in our large dry dock, which is 800 feet long. And then you see the Detroit Princess, which is actually a passenger uh, boat out of based in Detroit in the small uh, dry dock, which is 500 feet long. So we'll transition to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about uh, cargo. And of course, I could spend a long time talking about the various cargoes that are handled at the Port of Toledo. Uh, here's a listing of those terminals that handle the cargo at the port, a very diverse set of operators. You have large and small companies here. Um, some of these operators specialize in handling just one cargo, such as a salt terminal or a cement terminal. And then you have other terminals that handle a wide array of cargo. Uh, in Salido, we're pretty fortunate. Um, we import about as much as we export through our, our marine terminals. And um, uh, we have a lot of trade in the Great Lakes uh, uh, interlake traffic in our domestic shipments with other U.S. ports are roughly equal to our shipments uh, to and from Canadian ports. So again, very diverse in terms of uh, the types of cargo handled and diverse in terms of what's uh, coming and going from the port. So we can go to the next slide, please. So here's a listing of some of the commodities that are handled at the Port of Toledo. Um, basically, if you can load it on a vessel, there's gonna be a terminal at the port that can handle it. Some commodities are handled um, in different ways and go to serve industries within our region. Uh, so examples include uh, the Mondelez flour mill. They're still in operation. They bring in wheat from Canada and mill it into flour for the Nabisco bakeries. And you saw a picture of that mill in, uh, in Larry's slides actually. Uh, we also bring in salt shipments to treat our roads in the winter time, uh, iron ore, uh, comes in through the CSX dock and that goes down in rail cars to AK Steel down in Middletown, Ohio. Uh, we bring in pig iron from places like Russia and Brazil and the Ukraine, and that goes to um, North Star Steel in Delta, Ohio, for example. So the list goes on and on. We bring in sugar from Mexico and South America uh, for drink mixes. Um, the port really is a huge economic engine for the region. Uh, it supports over 7,000 jobs and has an annual economic impact for the community, which exceeds $1 billion annually. So we can go to the next slide. And uh, I'll take a few minutes and I'm gonna talk about the newest of the Port Authority's uh, marine terminals. And this terminal is appropriately named Ironville after the old neighborhood from the same area. Um, in 2008, uh, the former Chevron Gulf Oil property was acquired by the Port Authority so that we could expand and gain direct access to Norfolk Southern Railroad. And this was important for us at that time because our general cargo facility, which is operated by a company called Midwest Terminals, uh, who had been operating there since 2004, was literally bursting at the seams. There was no place to put more cargo there. That terminal was served by CSX, so we needed more real estate uh, to, put, to put the cargo handled at the port. And this, uh, this parcel, again, having that connection to Norfolk Southern was a strategic acquisition for the Port Authority. So we entered into a development uh, agreement with Midwest Terminals to acquire this property. And with the help of the state of Ohio and others, improvements were made to the site, which included the installation of the rail loop that you see here uh, in 2011. 
Uh, the dock face was reconstructed in 2012, and we also constructed a warehouse and ship unloading conveyor system in 2013. So by 2014, the facility officially opened is the Ironhead Marine Terminal, and we began to receive uh, vessels at this location for the first time in, in many, many years. We can go to the next slide, and um, you can see here the site is really comp uh, comprised of two different um, parcels. The first is a 74 acre parcel on the north side, um, right along the Maumee River. We call this the wet side of the property uh, where the improvements I mentioned took place. And then there's also a 107 acre uh, south parcel uh, right off of Front Street, and we call that the dry side of the facility. So the Port Authority spent about three, $4 million to acquire the site. About 23 million in improvements uh, were made to get it ready to receive the vessels. And after we had the infrastructure built there on the, on the wet side and we were operating, we shifted our focus to see what we could put on that, on that dry side of the site. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, so a major victory came for the whole region and for the Port Authority in June of 2017 when Cleveland Cliffs announced that they would invest in this uh, former brownfield site and construct a massive $850 million facility to produce a brand new feedstock for electric arc steel furnaces, uh, making a product called HBI or hot briquetted iron. Uh, this announcement marked a significant um, step forward for Cleveland Cliffs. Uh, they became the uh, sole producer of high quality HBI for the steel market in the entire Great Lakes region. So this project alone is going to bring about 2 million tons of additional cargo through the port of Toledo each year in the form of iron ore that's going to come down from, from Minnesota on U.S. flag. Uh, uh, lake trading vessels. The iron ore will be unloaded here in Salido at the Ironville terminal, and then it will go through the processing at the plant, and um, it will produce about 1.9 million tons of HBI each year. And that HBI then will be either trucked or railed to places like North Star Steel and Steel Dynamics and other electric arc furnaces throughout the, uh, the Toledo, Toledo region. So it's really a good American story. You have um, uh, U.S. Uh, Ohio-based natural gas uh, feeding the, the plant here. You have an Ohio-based uh, company in Cleveland Cliffs, one of the oldest uh, companies in, in the state and uh, one of the oldest mining companies in, in the world actually uh, operating this facility. You have a state-of-the-art uh, facility using uh, Midrex technologies, um, very um, you know clean compared to other other processes for steel making. Um, and, and, and you have this product then being shipped uh, to US steel mills to make steel that goes into uh, US uh, automobiles and appliances. And, and just think of the, um, the economic impact that has along the way for, for our region and the state and, and the country uh, as well. So I wanted to feature Ironville because you don't see brand new um, Great Lakes ports facilities like this popping up every day. And certainly we're fortunate um, to have this in Toledo. And we're also fortunate to have a waterfront that allows not just uh, this legacy industrial development and activity, but also the recreational activities that you've heard about uh, earlier. And, and of course, you know, a great place for uh, wildlife as well and for in the environment. So we can go to the next slide. I really wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to you about exciting developments at the port. Um, rest assured, you know, we continue to invest in all of our port facilities to ensure they are both uh, modern and competitive and as well as efficient. Uh, this year, we'll be investing about $20 million in a new dock wall reconstruction project at our general cargo facility. Uh, that facility will also be adding a new five and a half million dollar uh, Lee Bear 550 mobile harbor crane, and that's going to enhance our material handling capability. So, I guess you know, sadly, but but good for us, um, 
you know, the Libra will be replacing the, the Lucas cranes, who, which haven't operated in, in a number of years uh, down at the facility. And they'll complement our two other uh, Libra uh, 280 model uh, mobile harbor cranes. There's so much more I could tell you, uh, but unfortunately our time this evening is limited. You can follow the Port Authority on the social media channels that you see uh, listed here. Uh, also what you can do is take a virtual tour of the Port of Toledo by logging on to tourtheport.com. So that's pretty easy to remember, tourtheport.com. And uh, thank you very much for your attention and your interest in, in the great Port of Toledo. Thank you, Joe. Um, so we're going to do just a couple questions here because we're, um, you know, we want to be cognizant of everybody's time and we'll try to bring some back at the end if, if we can. Um, we've gotten, and I'm going to lump quite a few questions together into one. We had some interest in the thousand footers. Um, I know that the Paul R. Trigurtha, at least the center part, was built here in Toledo, um, but people are interested in whether the thousand footers are typically visiting Toledo today. They do. The thousand footers uh, can most commonly call on the coal and iron ore docks. So the iron ore dock is uh, known by many as Torco, and that is operated by CSX Railroad. That's where that ore comes in on the footers from Minnesota and is loaded onto rail cars uh, heading down to AK Steel. And then CSX also has a coal loadout operation. So even though coal volumes are diminishing uh, uh, year over year, you know, we still handle over 2 million tons of coal each year, and it's mainly metallurgical coal for, for different steel mills throughout the Great Lakes. So that coal from Appalachia and from the Powder River Basin is blended and then loaded out on, on footers um, that, you know, outbound. So, uh, yeah, the footers still have quite a presence here uh, at the Port of Toledo. Great. Um, and then I'll do one more quick question. Um, again, sorry, Larry, this one's for Joe. Um, can the general public tour the shipyards? You know, we used to bring a lot of people through these facilities and unfortunately because of um, September 11th and, and the new security restrictions, it's, it's more difficult to do that these days, um, which is probably, you know, probably the main reason we uh, started tourtheport.com is to be able to give people a virtual experience we're going to be working on uh, updating that site as well to, to embed more pictures and videos and give people a better sense of what's happening there. Um, you can see quite a bit from, from Front Street. If you walk along the sidewalk there looking in when there's a ship in dry dock, um, you know, you get a good appreciation for the size of the ships. I also try to go down and take pictures and put them on social media too to try to share the experience with as many people as I can. But Unfortunately, um, we just can't really get the general public in, in these secure facilities um, as we would like to, as much as we would like to. Thank you. Um, so I think we will move on. And then for everybody who still has questions we haven't answered, um, as I said, we will try to bring some of these back at the end. And if we can't get to them, we'll do our best to, um, I've been answering a few questions um, by text here as well. Um, but we will, you know, work to make sure anything gets answered as we go. All right. Thanks, Ellen. Um, thank you also to, <laughs> so, to uh, Larry and Joe. Uh, that was super exciting. Um, we're going to move on now to our final topic of the night. And if I may be so bold, perhaps one of my favorite topics of the night, um, navigation and safety. Uh, representing the then is Ted Long a local history author who's been studying Maumee Valley history for over 30 years. His book, Forgotten Visitors to Northwest Ohio, was released last fall to the University of Toledo Press. His latest book, 100 Things to Do in Toledo Before You Die, will be published by Reedy Press on April 1st. Besides writing books, Ted curates local audio history tours on the Voice Map app and curates a local history blog called HolyToledoHistory.com. So give me a second here, I have to get Ted on. Um, and then following Ted, we will have Sandy Bin, who is the uh, president of the Toledo Lighthouse Society. And then let me get your slides going here. 
Great, thanks, Kerry. I appreciate that, and really enjoyed these these uh, previous presentations. And I think they kind of do a great job of setting the table for what we're going to talk about with uh, safety and navigation. And we can go ahead and move on to the first slide. Um, you know, we've learned a lot about the history and, in particular, the commerce uh, that's going on in the Port of Toledo today and in the past. And you know, key to that is um, obviously the lake. And one thing I just want to point out is just how dangerous the lake can be, uh, particularly when you look at it from the then perspective. Um, this is a map that shows you about uh, 90 of the known shipwreck sites in the Ohio side of Lake Erie. And uh, right now, I think the numbers are somewhere around 600 shipwrecks in uh, Lake Erie, which makes up about 30% of the, I think, 2,000 shipwrecks that are in the Great Lakes. So, you know, Lake Erie and the port, they're pretty dangerous areas, particularly when you think about the past, um, you know, when they didn't have radar or GPS or all the technologies that we know today. Um, we go on to the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, what are the, the concerns when you bringing all this commerce in and out of the port via the lake. Um, obviously, one would be just adverse lake conditions, whether it's, you know, low water, high water, wh whatever it might be, the navigation hazards, and in particular, when you're talking about a, a shipping channel um, uh, like we have here in Toledo. Um, then you have the severe weather events. Uh, we looked at some of the flooding in Ted's presentation, um, gales, storms, fog, and then unfortunately, there's also human error, and we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, in the next slide, I want to talk just briefly about what was going on in terms of early safety and navigation. Um, obviously, we didn't have the technology we have today, so people were depending on basically charts, landmarks, uh, compass courses, and, and depths to really um, kind of navigate their way uh, within Lake Erie and uh, the Port of Toledo. They used lead lines, which we'll talk about in a minute, range lights, lighthouses, which Sandy will get into obviously, and then harbor tugs came in and were a big, big benefit uh, to be able to have those help guide the ships into, um, into Toledo. Uh, this next slide shows you just, you know, what, what I'm talking about when I say a lead line. This is basically just, you know, a length of rope with a lead weight attached and you'd set someone at the front end to drop these out and call out depths. Um, and before we had the ability to look at all the digital technology we have today, this is what a ship captain would have to use to make sure they were in the right channel and they were on the right path uh, coming in off the lake and into uh, Toledo. Uh, the next slide is, again, more of a text slide, but I want to just define what a range light is because this is really important because this was really the top technology technology available in, in the day in the then period. Range lights were a, a pair of lights or beacons that were used to indicate safe passage for vessels. So there were two lights. Um, they were positioned near one another. One was called the front light, which was lower. And then you had the rear light, which was higher. And at night when the ships were coming in, the two lights would only become aligned vertically when the ship was positioned in the uh, correct bearing. So they would use these range lights as a way to guide themselves into uh, Toledo. I don't have a picture of it, but um, if you go back and look on the internet, you'll find some old drawings of what the uh, uh, 1913 Cherry Street Bridge was supposed to look like. It was supposed to have two twin towers on either side where we have those um, kind of uh, housings today. And those were gonna be tall lights as well that would help guide someone through the channel. So lights were very important to the, the navigation process back in the then period. The next slide uh, kind of gives you an indication of what these, uh, these range lights look like. These are early photos uh, around the turn of the century of what were the Manhattan range lights. Um, this, this was actually 1904. Um, they look much more like lighthouses then uh, than they did eventually. Um, Clearly, you can see one being tall, one being a little bit um, shorter than the other. And in the next slide, you can see how they were updated. Um, the lighthouse look was removed and they were built more on towers. 
which I'm sure were easier to, uh, to maintain and manage. Um, and you can see these were part of the Manhattan range, which came right off where Manhattan kind of terminates on, um, on Front Street. So beacons and these uh, range lights were a big boon to uh, navigation safety for Maumee and the Port of Toledo. The next slide shows uh, Manhattan One as it looks today. Uh, in the late 18 or 1980s, the Coast Guard offered to sell these. And I think it was the Hanson Industries that came in and actually uh, cut them down and took them off. Uh, and then they were actually hauled away, one of which still is standing today at the Lighthouse Cafe over on Broadway that the zoo now owns and operates as um, their office complex. And I believe the second one is also still available or still up, and I think Hanson Industries has that one. So these, these towers, these beacons that have been, been around since the turn of the century are still around for you to take a look at if you ever want to explore them. The next slide is interesting. It's a uh, slide of the uh, keeper for the Maumee Bay range lights. This is Alfred Bauman. And this is a 1945 image that shows the, uh, him look, it looks like he's unlocking the doors for the uh, Maumee Bay range lights. Um, they were called the straight channel range lights. Uh, this gentleman was the keeper from 1942 to 1956. The next slide is uh, really kind of gives you an idea of how important the tugs were to safety and navigation uh, in, on the Maumee and, and the Port of Toledo. This is a 1914 image and it shows uh, Columbia, the A.W. Colton in Ohio and the J.R. Sprankle on the Maumee just above the construction of the Cherry Street Bridge in 1914. So they were just constructing uh, the bridge that we know today when this image was shot. At the time, the Sprankle and the Ohio were owned by the Great Lakes Towing Company. But these were a, a, a big factor in safety in the sense that people from the area who knew the river could come out on a tug and guide and uh, actually pull or push a boat through the channel and um, really increase the whole safety of the, of the process. And when we talk about safety, these next couple of slides give you an idea of what can happen on the, on the Maumee. These are some pretty um, probably infamous, I should say, shipwrecks that have occurred along the Maumee. This one is the Yuma, which uh, occurred in uh, 1908, uh, probably around the time, Ted, you talked about those, those flooding events that occur. This happened when ice on the Maumee caused the Yuma to come loose from its moorings and it struck the Cherry Street Bridge. And that eventually caused the span closest to downtown river to collapse or downtown to collapse into the river. It was semi rebuilt, but the bridge was never the same. And thus we had to rebuild it in um, 1913, 1914. Next slide is 1950. And this was uh, the Thunder Bay, which uh, uh, struck the Terminal Railroad Bridge. This is August 14th of 1950. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this is not a terribly uncommon experience. Uh, barges would get loose and, uh, you know, eventually they hit something to stop their flow and oftentimes it was a bridge. Um, insurance files are filled with events like this showing the damages to the bridges and the vessels. Um, so again, not an uncommon experience. And there's some great photos of these um, shipwrecks along the Maumee in the Port of Toledo exhibit that Carrie talked about in her introduction. The next slide, probably one of the most famous instance, incidents that's happened along the, uh, the Maumee. This is the Champlain that collided with the Facet Street Bridge in uh, April of 1967. Um, the Facet Street Bridge was completed in 1896 to become the second uh, Maumee River crossing to the what we know as the Martin Luther King Bridge or Cherry Street Bridge today. And on April 5th, 1967, an 80 mile per hour wind ripped the Champlain, which is an 8,700 ton lake freighter from the Baltimore, Ohio Railroad docks that Larry showed earlier and sent it crashing into the middle of the bridge. Um, and the, the span collapsed and there was no way to repair it. And thus Bassett Street no longer crosses the Maumee as, as it did back in the day. Uh, there's some fascinating stories that go along with this particular incident. If you can go to the next slide. 
um, it just gives you a, a sense of what a, a, how big a story it was. Um, what I find interesting, if you see, look at the bottom uh, of this image, you see a, a headline says, Ottoist on bridge credits red light was saving his life. And this is a story of this gentleman, uh, Bauer Corwin, uh, who was a Perrysburg insurance salesman. He was actually in a hurry, was trying to get to the other side and was stopped by a, a, a red light. And he remembers sitting there thinking to himself, this red light is gonna cost me getting where I need to be on time. And then suddenly the boat crashes in and he realized the, that light probably saved his life or he probably would have been on the bridge in the middle of the span when the boat crashed into it. Next slide. This is just another interesting kind of angle and you can just see the destruction of uh, what happened here. And these 80, and this particular uh, caption says 90 mile an hour winds. I mean, really destructive on their own, but then you have this huge freighter being pushed into the bridge and you can see what happens. So what, what happens now in terms of 20th century safety and navigation? Obviously, we start to see the introduction of radio beacons, sonar and radar, uh, the gyroscopic compass, Loran GPS, <laughs> completely changes the, you know, the whole picture of safety and navigation uh, uh, in the Port of Toledo. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sandy to talk about um, probably one of the most famous uh, navigation beacons that we're all aware of here in, in um, our, our area. Thank you, Ted. Um, I just want to go back and kind of talk about the river and the amazement. And there was a question on the Maumee River about the clarity of it. And from the studies I've done, the reason that the Maumee turned muddy was because Europeans brought carp over here and the carp ate the vegetation on the bottom of the river. And that really was what caused the Maumee to become the muddy Maumee. Obviously, agriculture and everything contributed to that after, but it changed the bottom, which really changed the nature of the river. And it's shallow, as we all know. So I look back and, you know, I lived in the North End. I'll start with a bit of a personal story. I grew up on Chestnut Street um, in the North End of Toledo. And I remember the bridges crashing into the uh, other boats, the ships crashing into the bridges. Um, I also remember Hosco's Fishery down on Water Street. And I kind of remember remember the commercial fishermen and everybody there. That has all changed now. Um, a lot of the recreational and fishery that we knew in Toledo um, is pretty much gone. And I find that this discussion of the river and the amazing waters rather sad in that I'm really glad that Glass City Park is coming back and the Great Lakes Museum is here and the zoo now has a, you know, an, exhibit with the local fish, with the freshwater fish. But treasuring our waters is really important. And these lights were part of the history. So we can go to the next slide and we can kind of see what happened um, with um, Turtle Island, which was, if you know, if you come out of the Maumee River and into Maumee Bay, it's a little ways out, maybe a mile or so out from the river into the bay toward Lake Erie. And the ice sheets that came out of the river really destroyed this lighthouse several times because it was vulnerable in shallow waters. And the force of the river, as we all know in the spring, is terrific and really causes problems. So you see the artist's rendering of the second Turtle Island Lighthouse, and then you see its demise. It actually, we quit using this light in, when the Toledo Lighthouse was built in about 1904. And so you see the 1925 picture of the lighthouse, and then you can see 2019 on the bottom um, when the storms came and again, the ice, somebody had purchased this and tried to restore the island um, to having tourists come there, but it was, it's on the Michigan Ohio line. They didn't have a lot of money and it, it didn't happen. So you now see on the right-hand side, um, the remains of the Turtle Island Lighthouse, which has been up by the um, Department of Interior actually for sale, but no one has taken it over because when you take it over, you commit to restoring it. Um, next slide. And so this is just a perspective of kind of one of the struggles of the lights and the waters in our area is really that the Maumee River um, goes into Maumee Bay and then into Lake Erie. 
And of course, this is the shallowest end of the lake. And the bay's average depth is only um, 10 to 12, 14 feet. So we have to have that yellow line in the middle is the shipping channel, which when the lights were there and the ABC is kind of one set of the range lights. And then you see where Turtle Island is. And then later you see where the Toledo Lighthouse was located. But when it was jagged and the bay was very shallow and we didn't have the deepened channel, the boats would have trouble navigating through it. And the lights were very important to try and help the boaters get from Lake Erie into the river. I don't know how the ferries, the very large ferries and whatever navigated, there's all kinds of stories about how they got stuck in winds and whatever, as we all know in Lake Erie. So this is just a perspective of the areas. And then as time went on and the, it changed in our area, um, because we had a dredge the shipping channel to 28 feet, it's the most dredged shipping channel in the Great Lakes, a million cubic yards a year. Um, the places to put the dredge materials are one and two. There's a 160 acre grassy island facility where one is at on the north end. And here in um, the Oregon area, there's number two, that's 500 acres, all of dredge. And the dredgings are still going into there. They're now gonna raise it up to 20 feet. So um, the nature of our channel is not a natural system at all. It's an altered system to facilitate the shipping industry, which we need, um, but also, poses some water quality challenges. Next slide. So these are just the range lights. And I guess part of the reason I just put this in here is because these were historic um, places. And the one thing um, that wasn't brought up is the, the, the center one, which is a pretty large um, crib light, um, was taken out, um, blown up. Um, I don't have the pictures from the blade, but I think in the 50s. And so, we lost some of our history and it seems like we didn't say much about it. Next slide. And again, this is just Mommy Bay and how we've altered it through and what the challenges are that we have in terms of um, navigating in our waters because of the shallowness of that bay in between Lake Erie and Mommy River. And of course we see the algae where we've altered and we get discharges out of the river into the bay and the lake. Next slide. So here is the Toledo Lighthouse. So when they straightened the shipping channel um, and decided not to rebuild Turtle Island again, um, they decided to do the Toledo Lighthouse. And because they knew the problems that they had at Turtle Island, our lighthouse is extremely unique in that the roof is built like the upside down hull of the ship. The steel came from Carnegie and US Steel at the turn of the century. And it remains, architects tell us it's a wonder in terms of just its whole design. And um, there's nothing like it anywhere in the world. So we suspect or expect that when our lighthouse is restored, a lot of people will come just to see the roof. You'll also notice that this was a man-made crib. So the lighthouse was not on any given land structure. The crib was built um, in the water and the lighthouse then in it, there is a cellar in this lighthouse that um, has a cistern in it and it's perfectly dry. It's where they started with coal and then um, kept it clean. So you see that. And so on the right hand side, you see that's a 1955 photo. So you begin to see where it's deteriorating a bit around the base. And, but you also notice on these two photos, well, you can't see it on the left one. But on the right hand one, you can see where we had access to the Toledo Lighthouse where people could actually get in it from a boat on the right side or the left side of the lighthouse, um, which made it a little bit easier. Next slide. So then again, this again is just the uh, 1955 picture of kind of, this is when the keepers were still at the lighthouse. People were staying here till the mid sixties until the light was automated. Um, next slide. And so what happened was between the 60s and the 80s, there was a movement actually that our lighthouse was going to be blown up and taken down just like the crib light. And as we understand, um, the people that were lighthouse enthusiasts around the United States, the whole country had an outcry along with local people. And so the Coast Guard then decided that they would um, keep it. But between the 60s and the 80s, there was no one at the lighthouse and it was vandalized. People partied there. There's stories from um, boaters that went out there and took some artifacts or just had some parties and had some fun. So the Coast Guard was determined when they fortified it, as I would 
like to say, in 1988, 89, um, they then um, boarded up the lighthouse, put cement block windows in the first floor and plexiglass in the other floors um, to try and keep it. Next slide. So you see on the left what the original lighthouse was like, and you see on the right what happened after 1989. So you see where they built the steel wall um, on the side where we get the Northeasterns, which makes it really treacherous. And along that steel wall is where the ships come because it still is a functioning lighthouse and aid to navigation. The foghorn still works. The light is lit every night. Um, that light, actually the original Fresnel, three and a half order Fresnel lens that was in the light um, is not, was taken originally to um, its imagination station before it was imagination station. Um, and when that closed, um, we were able to get the light and it's now, it was in the lodge at Maumee Bay State Park and it's now in the nature center at Maumee Bay State Park. So it's a three and a half water, beautiful Brunel lens. But this light was automated in the mid sixties. And when it was automated, no one had to be in the lighthouse anymore. And that's what caused the vandalism because no one was there and the problems. So when the Coast Guard fortified it, they really didn't want anyone to get into it. And that steel wall has a huge undertow. So if you try to put your boat up against it, um, any aluminum wood boat, um, it, unless it's perfectly still, you're not gonna succeed. Um, most of the boats when we take them out are steel boats. And um, so when they fortified it and they put the boulders around three sides so you can no longer have two side access into the lighthouse, but they secured the lighthouse and the structure of the lighthouse is in good condition. Next slide. So in, in 20 and 21, um, we decided, um, we worked, we have a Lighthouse Society, a nonprofit group of 501c3, and we worked for about eight years on getting a grant. We actually had a grant approved, but it was, it's a federal grant, it's complicated. And it's tough for a small organization to take on projects like this. But we're very proud that in 20 and 21, we were able to execute the, the grant and actually have first floor um, brickwork, windows, shutters, doors. Um, that was completed in November of 2020. And the second floor will be done in May of 21. Uh, this is a $630,000 project with 80% from a grant, 20% match. We were able to get um, $20,000 from Cleveland Cliffs for this project. And we have a loan from Genoa Bank for $118,000. Next slide. I didn't realize, um, should have, I guess, that in walking in the lighthouse for the past 10, 15 years, when it was boarded up, you never were able to see outside from the inside, except when the door was open. So none of the windows, when you walked around the first floor, you just went upstairs because it was all cement blocked in and very dark. Um, this project has put in original windows and shutters, um, tucked the brick and made sure we've, um, we're restoring it and keeping it in good shape. Um, it's an amazing project and it's been really fun to watch. It's ex exciting to see this great lighthouse. It's 4,000 square feet um, with a three-story tower and a parapet at the top um, come to life again. Next slide. Um, this is the project, as you can see from the inside for the windows. The back door was actually covered by a workstation in the 70s. I'm not sure why they did it, but you can see the, for the first time that door is open since um, we, we took it over in 2008, we actually got title to the lighthouse. Um, next slide. So here's our grand lighthouse. It's now um, the light and the foghorn are operated by solar power. The cable that went to the lighthouse from shore was severed in the 90s. So we will only have solar power in the lighthouse. Um, this just shows the amazing new windows. These shutters will seal shut, are sealed shut for the winter. And they can be opened uh, when someone's there in the summer, but we'll have the ability to make sure that it's secure um, as well as to be able to see out on all four sides. And you can see Westchester and the Michigan shoreline, the, Toledo shoreline, it's an amazing place to go into. It's an amazing building out in Lake Erie. Um, and by the way, the lighthouse is really located where Maumee Bay meets Lake Erie. So it's when the Coast Guard and whoever the engineers were that did this, they really did make it an aid to navigation because it just says where the shipping channel is going to be 
and where the waters, if you get out of that shipping channel, are extremely shallow. Next slide. So here's the lighthouse. You can see the, um, the improvements on the first floor. We'll have them on the second floor. Unfortunately, we didn't have funding to complete the windows on the third floor. Uh, but you can see when you pull your boat up, this is the side you go into on the right-hand side. You can see the rung ladders that you climb up with. Uh, we did have a boat lift here that we're hoping maybe this year or next uh, we'll be able to put back up. Um, it's actually a dock lift um, that you can put a boat up to so you can safely dock your boat without banging into the wall. Next slide. So this is just a wonderful picture of the shipping channel and you can see it on the far side of the ship going by. Um, when the ships go by, there's a huge wake that it creates so you don't want your boat to be tied up at the lighthouse during that point in time. Um, but clearly when the storm of um, the tornado in Point Place um, hit, um, we had one of the keepers saying that he was up in the um, third floor and he actually bought uh, named his window, um, bought the window having naming rights for that window. Um, because clearly this is an aid to navigation and the ships um, clearly are part of the story. Next. So here's just kind of where we're at um, and what's going on. Um, the total cost for the restoration will be about two and a half million dollars. There's three phases, the exterior, the infrastructure, the plumbing, the wiring, et cetera, and the finishing. It'll have solar power. Um, it'll have, have gray water um, that's treated um, just for washing. All drinking water will have to be brought in. It'll have a marine wastewater facility. Um, again, we're a 501c3 nonprofit established in 2004. We took title for the lighthouse in 2008. We have over 400 members. All of us are owners. We're all volunteers. Um, and we're all working to try and um, restore the lighthouse. We think and we know that a restored lighthouse um, that's open to the public will attract many tourists from around the country, if not around the world. Um, you know, it'll be a major tourist attraction for the area. It's positive for Toledo and Lake Erie um, because lighthouses are beacons and places that people like to go to. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Sandy. Ellen's coming on here with a couple of questions. Hi, I'm back. Um, so we've gotten some more questions here. We're going to keep it a little bit brief so we can try to wrap up by nine o'clock. So I'm going to ask um, probably just one or two questions for Sandy and Ted, and then we'll bring everybody in and see if we can get a couple more. Um, we did have a question, Sandy. Um, first, they said, what a great project about the lighthouse. And then how are you preventing vandalism today at the lighthouse? It's just buckled up. I mean, we just, we seal it and it's very difficult to access. So we had cameras, we'll put the cameras back out there. It's difficult because of the electric issues um, to have Wi-Fi and things out there. I should have added too that um, we will have four people staying in the lighthouse when it's completed and it will be open to the public from spring through fall. We really want to have the public share in this great Lake Erie experience and Toledo experience. Thank you. Um, and then I think the other question that's relevant for this section um, is, this one was for Ted. Um, do you know if sextants were used for Great Lakes navigation or were ships mostly relying on coastal landmarks? Uh, you know, I can't answer that question. I'm not that, you know, I didn't, I didn't go that deep, but I would imagine it was a combination of both. Um, I feel like I should know the answer better to that as well. Carrie, do you? <laughs> um, I do believe sextants were used somewhat on the Great Lakes. Um, yes, obviously you need land navigation, but I mean, when you get out into the middle of the lake, there are times when you can't see land at all. So you need some way to guide yourself. Thank you. So why don't we um, bring the rest of the panelists in? I was going to say Carrie should join us as well. I think a couple of these um, you know, between the, what does that make now, eight of us, <laughs> um, I think we can get some of these answered for people. And then, as I said, we'll try to wrap up in about the next five minutes. Um, I did want to get one out of the way that I think is just a quick answer. Uh, this was for Shannon, um, and it was, what is hammocking? 
Uh, hammocking is one of the newer uh, opportunities that we're actually offering at the park in designated locations. So it's literally um, where you take your hammock and you tie it in between in between two trees and you're able to actually hammock in the park district. Um, we are very specific at this point in time about locations for that because we are suffering from oak wilt um, and oak wilt is easily uh, spread from one oak tree to another depending on how far the bark has been damaged. Um, so we do have specific locations for that, um, but we also do have programmings that will introduce you to hammocking and how to hammock safely in the area. Um, but we are spread out into regions, so each region does have um, a hammocking location, which makes it easy for anybody to um, enjoy the new activity. It is relatively new. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and while we were, why don't we do another for you? Um, are you planning to use the new park and its facilities for environmental education programming for the city, sorry, city school students? Yes, we are. So one of the things that we do want to focus in on um, is education, environmental education, especially in our conservation and natural resources um, activities that we do have taking place. Um, we are looking at having a specific location um, for ourselves and our partners in a building um, that will then be able to have educational programming that takes place specifically on site there. Um, so we are working through a myriad of opportunities and partnerships are going to help us really reach into the community to do that environmental education. Um, we are also looking at that through Manhattan Marsh, which abuts uh, Chase STEM um, School, which is also one of our newer parks that we opened um, uh, in 2020. Thank you. Um, so this is a question that I think could be answered by anyone. Um, when was the Port of Toledo established? Um, it was known, and this is part of the question, it was known as the District of Miami and Port of Miami from 1805 to sometime around 1850. Um, but I think what they're asking might be a little bit about when the city was established, but also I know the Port Authority um, wasn't established until the 1950s. Um, so if anybody has any comments on the question. <laughs> it may be hard to pinpoint that one. The, yeah. the Toledo Port Authority was established in 1955, which was just a few years prior to the opening of the, of the Seaway when it, when it first came under construction. Um, but I think you know this would date back uh, further, maybe to when when the villages came together and and formed the city. I don't know if, if Ted knows that or not. Which Ted? We got to. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, well, eight, 1837 is the official date of the city of Toledo, but the port was there being used before that. The little villages of Port Lawrence and Vistula. And even the little thing called Ford Industry, where there actually was a little blockhouse, um, goods were shipped there and then uh, given to the Indians uh, right after uh, 1800, uh, even before the War of 1812. So, it, you know, it, it's been around uh, for a couple hundred years in one and, form or another. And I just add to Ted's comment there, I think that when you go back to those very early days, most of the traffic came all the way in and most of the commerce took place right at where Swan Creek and the, uh, the river meet. Uh, that was really kind of the uh, action center for quite a while. Thank you. So we're at 8.59 here. So I thought we might end here with a question that's not necessarily topical at all, but um, we have a viewer from Chicago who has only been to Toledo once, um, and they noticed we were mentioning the Docks restaurants. Um, is there a specific one that you would recommend? That could be any of you. <laughs> They're all good. <laughs> there, that yeah, I mean, that would have been my answer. But... Good. Yeah, you can't go wrong. I was gonna <laughs> say if you haven't been there, it has almost everything you could want: Italian, Japanese, seafood, Mexican. I'm probably forgetting some, so yeah. There's the new, I hope they're still operating, there's new Hamburger Mary's, which is a drag themed restaurant as well. All right. And, and right yeah, now, Tony Paco's. Oh, well, yes, can't forget. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yes. But no trip to Toledo would be 
proper without going to one of the packets. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of you and thank you to everybody who attended. Um, this was a a really big topic uh, to encompass. And, and I'm really pleased with how we did that with our round table today. So thank you to Ted and Shannon and Larry and Joe and Ted, again, different Ted and, and Sandy. Um, they've all kind of mentioned, many of them have uh, written about the, the history of Toledo. Um, and there's certainly lots going on today so that you can go visit. So go visit the new uh, Metro Parks uh, in the spring, go out in summer, go out and visit the lighthouse, um, check out what's going on at the Port of Toledo, um, visit East Toledo and East Toledo Historical Society. And don't forget, Ted Long has a brand new book coming out on April 1st, The 100 Things You've Got to Do in Toledo Before You Die. To our listener from Chicago, this is what you need. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe the National Museum of the Great Lakes is mentioned somewhere in that book. Um, so thanks, don't forget to check out uh, our our exhibit, the Port of Toledo Then and Now, uh, on our website, nmgl.org. And just to let you know, our next lecture um, will be in three weeks from tonight, uh, is, will be given by Patricia Mayer, who is the author of, of Ladies of the Light, Michigan Women in the U.S. Lighthouse Service. And she's going to be presenting on that topic. Um, and that'll be February 24th at 7 p.m. As part of that sign up, you will have the option of purchasing the book at that time. Um, and then our third lecture will be on March 17th by Jerry Kuntz, who will discuss the early days of diving in the Great Lakes. Mm. Um, last of all, I always have to say, if you're not a member of the National Museum of the Great Lakes, please consider joining. Um, you can learn so much more about us at nmgl.org. And if you're interested in joining, nmgl.org backslash membership. Thank you again to all of our panelists and to all of you that have been with us through tonight. Please stay healthy and safe, and we will see you again in three weeks. Have a good night. Good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye, everyone.